Dicritinib is a JAK2 inhibitor and it's being developed for the treatment of myelofibrosis. Now, it hit the news in early 2016 when the FDA placed a full clinical hold on myelofibrosis trials exploring picritinib. The FDA wanted to see the final data from the PERSIST-2 trial for further review, and so let's talk about that, shall we? I'm with Dr. John Mascarenas, who is an MD and uh, now an associate professor of medicine, specifically hematology and medical oncology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Let's start with the drug first itself, what it does and what led to that hold that the FDA placed on this. So picritinib is an oral multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits JAK2, FLT3, IRAC1, and other, other kinases. Um, it's one of many um, inhibitors that are being evaluated in the myelofibrosis space. Right now, ruxolitinib and BJAK1-2 inhibitors is the only approved therapy for patients with intermediate or higher risk myelofibrosis in a platelet count greater than 50,000. So this drug, um, earlier on in, in its development, showed that it is a, an effective drug in reducing spleens and symptoms and perhaps less myelosuppressive than ruxolitinib, which opens up a, a niche, particularly in patients with low platelets. So the PERSIST-2 study was a study that followed PERSIST-1. PERSIST-1 was a randomized phase three study comparing uh, picritinib to best available therapy, which excluded ruxolitinib. Uh, and that was a positive uh, study. And studies today in myelofibrosis are typically co-primary endpoints of spleen reduction and symptom burden improvement. Um, and that study was um, irregardless of platelet count. The PERSIST-2 is different in that it's patients um, who've either previously been treated with, with uh, ruxolitinib or who have a platelet count less than 50,000 that would not be able to be treated with ruxolitinib. So thrombocytopenia. Yep, so platelets count under 100,000. So tell us about the trial and what you found. So it's a randomized phase three study that unfortunately had a full clinical hold placed on it in February of this year, which means that the, the total number of patients accrued, 311, weren't fully evaluable for the intention to treat analysis. There was only about 221 patients. But what we found was that if you broke down the response, it's a co-primary endpoint, at 24 weeks of spleen reduction, which is 35% or greater by imaging, that it met that primary endpoint when compared to best available therapy. And I should say there were three arms in the trial. Um, VID dosing, Q-day dosing of picritinib, and then best available therapy. And about 40 to 50% of patients in best available therapy actually went on to ruxolitinib, which again was uh, the majority of patients who had already been on ruxolitinib previously because there really is no um, right. alternative agent. So the spleen response endpoint was met. The symptom response, unfortunately, wasn't. There was a trend to improvement um, in total symptom score, 50% reduction or greater, in the, the pooled um, Q-day and BID dosing. If you broke that apart and looked at the BID dosing, it was statistically significant um, compared to best available therapy. Um, so it's, it's a, it unfortunately didn't meet the co-primary endpoint, but I still think that there's a lot of um, great data there, even though the study was abbreviated because of the full clinical hold, um, that shows us that the drug has activity, particularly at the BID dosing. Well, what about the excess deaths in cardiac and hemorrhagic events in PERSIST-1 that got the FDA's attention? What did you see? So in, in PERSIST-2, we, we looked at that. Um, it, there doesn't, and we have a survival curve that shows the survival of patients in the Kaplan-Meier curve uh, in the three arms. And there doesn't really seem to be a difference in overall survival when you look at that, that data. Um, there seems to be maybe an increased risk of bleeding associated with picritinib, particularly with the BID dosing. But when you look at the mature data, there really isn't a difference, um, a concerning difference in, in death in, in those arms. Um, you know, one has to also frame this discussion around the fact that these are patients with low platelets. Low platelets are, are a recognized negative prognostic indicator. And, and those are patients that typically don't do well and are at risk for bleeding and having, um, you know, MPN-related events. So, um, you know, some of that I think is, is difficult to interpret. Um, but it, it, the, the drug, when given BID, does seem to be both an effective drug and a safe drug to, to give. So I think that more studies will likely need to be done, and the, the company actually has to go back to the FDA and discuss with them the path forward. Um, but I still think that this is a viable option that should be explored. So you're at least optimistic now after the after the problems back in February, it's looking better. I think it's looking better. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really happening to optimize the dosing of the drug, too. I think the, the BID dosing is probably superior to the QD dosing in terms of its efficacy and tolerability. You know, I should, I should mention it is a FLT3 inhibitor, so GI toxicity was seen, although it was manageable, was not really a major reason for a discontinuation. Well, hopefully it'll be back in the news in something in a positive manner here before too very long. Yeah. For uh, ASH Clinical News, please check out online as well as in print for our coverage from ASH in San Diego. I'm Rick McGuire.